front of you. So it's kind of expanding the way we're going to experience events. And to me, as uh, you know, a connoisseur of visual communication and image making, that's that's a great thing uh, to think about, <laughs> right? And, and to wonder is this good or bad? You know, um, generally, I think most of this stuff is a great expansion of our capabilities when used ethically and responsibly. Yeah, here's a kind of a laughable one, but you could imagine uh, walking up to somebody on the left, registered sex offender, right? On the right, slutty ex-girlfriend. And then you could review profile, you could ignore that person or change your settings about that person. Um, down here, you have some ad. Buy this shirt from Banana Republic, $65, next day shipping, right? So, oh, I love that hoodie. Click, I just bought my own, right? Uh, and then you see the guy on the left, and we've seen lots of uh, articles and stories on this. He's like, drink Coke, right? He's maybe getting a few cents every time someone views him on their augmented reality app saying, drink Coke. He's a walking advertisement, right? Now, this isn't a real app. I, I think it just kind of shows you the possibilities of this stuff. Possibilities. Uh, here's a device. Um, it's actually a contact lens, and uh, it's developed using polyethylene terephthalate. It's uh, a plastic that you would find in a Coca-Cola 20-ounce bottle, right? And it can lock right into the eye, and it has uh, circuits and transistors built into it that give you what's called a head-up display. So what that's saying is, imagine those augmented reality apps we just kind of glimpsed right on your retinas, right? How much would something like that cost? Like the, the contact lenses? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're not sure is yet, but we can, we can guess. Like These glasses are over a grand. Oh, okay. So. Okay. Um, but, you know, when the first uh, digital camera came out, it was under a megapixel, and it was like $900, you know? So... What happens is these things come down dramatically real quick. We see it with the Kindle. Remember the Kindle reader, two, two years ago, was starting at like $300. And now you can get it for under $100. Um, this is, a lot of the stuff, though, that I'm showing you is developed by military, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, um, or medical uh, institutions. This is actually developed for uh, diabetics to wear in, it actually reads uh, the cells and the sugar levels in their tear fluid, and it will, on their uh, retina, say, you know, your sugar level is too high or too low, right? And it can also uh, screen for glaucoma. So uh, there's lots of um, biofeedback technology being integrated into the body. Um, neurotransmitters that go into the brain and can screen for different types of diseases and kind of be on the lookout for um, danger, if you will. Let's go back to our army man, right? He's got his robo suit on and now they're going to give him a sort of a Terminator vision here. This, uh, this uh, viewing device would allow uh, him to see things way, um, you know, a mile out into the distance and recognize, is that an AK-47 or is it a broomstick? Uh, it would allow him to see what's behind him in the field. It would allow him to hone in on a target and lock in with his rifle and identify the target as enemy or friendly. Uh, so we are, in a way, kind of creating this, you know, super trooper, if you will, that would be using a lot of technologies on the ground to kill. Um, here's an example of something I was just mentioning. Uh, you have a circuit being put into human cells and by um, interpolating information happening in those cells, it can actually look and screen for diseases that the person may be um, showing signs of. Right. Um, so that's a lot of the things that I see happening in our lives and in our world right now. And I've been kind of keeping a close eye on this for you know five or six years now, and using a lot of the ideas to um, 
make my artwork and to inform what I want to talk about with my artwork. Right? Uh, and you know, I've shown you a, a snippet of what's going on there. The most recent thing that I ran across was a, a neck band that a paraplegic can wear around their neck. You know, like those little things you wear on the plane so you don't get sore. But this one's a little uh, higher end. Uh, this neck band picks up where we're talking about paraplegics now, right? You can't move, you can't speak, you're in your bed, you know, you can't do much. Um, but you're there and you're aware, right? Um, and if you've done any research or watched news, you would remember the amazing science where a paraplegic patient could actually move a cursor around on a computer. Have you ever heard or seen of this? Just by thinking about it. Well, they've now created a band that the patient can wear around their neck. This gets a little uh, intense here for me to think about. Wear around the neck, and then it taps into Broca's area of the brain. Uh, that's the area of the brain where we develop uh, our language and thought skills and patterns, okay? So that's the speaking area of the brain. It taps into the firings between neural synapses there, takes that data, runs it through a computer, interpolates it, and outputs it as a spoken sentence. So what I'm saying is this band can speak for someone what they're thinking. Right? Um, any dangers there? Yeah, right? Well, not only can it read your thoughts and speak for you if you can't do that, it can differentiate between a thought you would want to say and a thought you would want to think. And it would not speak the thought you would want to think. Because when we think, different neurons are firing and different patterns are emerging. Uh, and this goes back way, uh, you know, 50s and 60s in cybernetic theory with the guys like uh, Warren McCullough and Norbert Wiener and a guy, uh, Lorente Deneau, who first kind of came up and said, our brains operate like binary computer code, right? And they really do. We have, we've seen these neural network images where different neurons are lit up, right? The other ones are off, and it's either on or off. And we have different patterns that occur when we're thinking, when we're running, you know, and this is all, like, integrates highly into our brain chemistry. Um, that's a lot of the stuff I was reading when I first started this project uh, on cybernetics and informatics and exchange of information um, and how it's been dramatically changing. Okay, so that's kind of what inspires me to do what I do. And now I want to look at some of the work, um, newer and older. I guess this project began in 2006. Um, and, and it's kind of all umbrellaed under that portfolio, Formatting Gaia. But then there's been many other portfolios that I've traveled along um, since then. And so let's just look at some of these. Uh, and, and hopefully you can kind of get an idea of what I'm thinking about. Again, this integration of our technology into the world, into the body, which is what I guess I'm here to talk about today, the embodiment of the technology. Um, and, and we should, you know, start to think, you know, is this good? Is this bad? We need to stand somewhere as individuals in the 21st century because this is happening. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's subtle, right? I mean, this may as well be in my body. It probably will be in the next decade. How many people get anxiety when they leave their home without this? Probably most of you, right? 10 years ago, we didn't really have these. We had pagers, right? They were leading into these 11 years, 12 years. Um, you know, they, they didn't take off. 20 years ago, we didn't really have the internet, right? So these things seem like you know, nothing to us because they happen very subtly. Like, we didn't wake up on Wednesday after going to bed Tuesday night and the internet was there, right? We had bulletin board services, we had Prodigy, we had AOL. I mean, that was a big one. That was a big step, right? And we, so we slowly merged into this culture we're living in today, and it's continuing to happen. Congenital skin, right? Congenital being something you're born with um, and develop as you grow. 
I later did a project on uh, obstetrics and using technology to help integrate uh, a more sound birthing process. Replenishing the hemoglobin. I'm really overly fancy with my titles. I'm aware of that problem. Um, but, you know, we've kind of seen some of the stuff I showed you medically, where this inspiration comes from. And so you can see where it moves from science into art, which is more of my realm, and kind of how I make sense of it and then visualize it, right? And so it's not supposed to be something that would happen. It's supposed to be the idea of it happening. Intravenous restore. We have a closer version. I find I like to do that a lot. Um, I like to take an image and then I like to get closer and kind of do my own cropping of it and then pair them together. I think, I think it works kind of nicely. And then call it a different thing. This one's material taste. Transferring vitality. So this was all in graduate school. This is kind of the beginning of uh, my work. And there's this sort of stillness that, that the photograph is so good at doing. Uh, but there's also this kind of action that kind of looks at negatives and positives and sort of avoid uh, all at once through the body. matrix-esque thing going on there. I did get uh, a bit of a skin rash from that one. It was an unpleasant body of stagnant water at a construction site, but it made a very good image, so I do not regret it. Evening reboot. So this is probably the first image of the series uh, that was successful. And it's one that's kind of stuck with uh, me um, uh, as sort of a branded image uh, ever since. And so if you've noticed, we started right in the landscape, and then we moved into the body. And now uh, this third stage that I'm actually embarking upon right now begins to say, okay, so we put our technology into our earth, we put it into our bodies, what's happening, right? So the stage that I'm kind of just getting into years later after beginning this uh, project is looking at what are the results of this technology? What, what is it going to do in our lives? What new powers or new experiences will we gain from it, right? So we have that last one, cultivating minds, you know, this idea of like mind farming and uh, growing organs and vats, which we can now do. Um, this one's called harness. You know, if, if these things are in our body and we can extend them into ourselves, what can they then extend out of us? And so you see this uh, woman sort of harnessing this new, you know, maybe it's, it's a cosmic energy, maybe it's a real energy that's, you know, electrically developed, maybe it's just a symbol for her newfound spirituality in, in a technological era. Uh, but that's up to whoever's looking at it. Then I mentioned the obstetrics, so I threw a few of these in here. This one's called Genetic Scan 1. So you see the um, pregnant woman sitting in her chair in her living room. You know, you have a teddy bear over here. It's very cute. Um, and then there's some devices on her stomach that you see. Uh, but again, I like to kind of pair images so I get closer. Then you can see the little guys that I made uh, at home before I went to take the picture. And these guys, uh, you know, with the context of the title, are scanning for genetic disorders, um, genetic diseases. Perhaps, uh, you know, they're ensuring that the blonde hair, blue eyed boy that she really wants is actually developing the right way, right? Um, perhaps they're screening for. Um, 
diseases, uh, and you know they're going to correct any problems that are going on there. So edema constraint pulse, uh, and so we have all these little uh, electrodes glued to her belly. Edema is a fancy word for swelling, uh, and the swelling that occurs when you are pregnant. So. You know, these ideas come to me when I'm browsing through a book on obstetrics because I'm now doing the project and I'll see some issue that may be, you know, unpleasant, and then I'll make the photograph about it, right? This one's a little newer, I don't really feel well about it, but uh, on the left you have one called Stabilizer. And so she's going through this neurological adjustment. Her brain chemistry is being adjusted to this audio-visual device. And then on the right, this one's called Carrier. And so you see, see uh, her Carrier uh, at home. Uh, and, and then, you know, on the right, she's looking down on herself. Uh, I don't know about that. Maybe I've been watching too much Battlestar Galactica. But... You know, in my mind, she's going to go off to her 9 to 5. Her carrier will take care of uh, keeping the baby safe during the day. When she gets home, I don't know, she'll plug in and download the baby back to her. Science fiction, absolutely. Science, absolutely. Art, absolutely. Right? I'm not interested in being an inventor, or I'm not interested in being you know, perfect on um, my ideas. I'm just interested in kind of sharing my observances. I did some studio shots here. Check tech and body. X. I don't know. We need to work on getting these things to work in a more healthy manner, right? The Industrial Revolution was a stepping stone for the way we exist uh, on Earth. You can look um, to where I now live, the state of Pennsylvania, uh, is a great example of catastrophe, right? Pittsburgh, my current hometown, is uh, recovering from a horrible uh, steel industry and environmental pillage. Um, these guys used to go into work, I mean, it made the money, right? But it was killing them simultaneously. And so there's this strange thing occurring where your livelihood and your well-being and your ability to support your family is killing you, uh, you know, physically. These guys would go to work and come home covered in black soot from the uh, steel mines or the coal, the coal mines or the steel factories. Um, you know, they actually have walk-ins in the basement where they, before they even walked into the house, they'd take off all their clothes and shower to wipe the stuff off. Houses were black. You know, you could spray wash them Monday morning and by, you know, Wednesday afternoon they'd be black again. You couldn't see the sun on some days, even though the forecast was, you know, bright and sunny because there was a cloud of haze over the environment. You know, Three Mile Island occurred as well in uh, Pennsylvania. They now have natural gas mines uh, underground that are on fire, literally, and they're blowing through the surface of the uh, you know, streets or out in the woods. So there's been a lot of problems with our technology and the way we're using it, maybe we're not using it for the right reasons, right? One of my favorite quotes by Bucky Fuller is, we're inventing all the right technology for all the wrong reasons. And, you know, we go back to the war stuff, right? I mean, DARPA is probably where 90% of this new technology comes from. And it's designed for military use. The internet, 
came out of DARPANET, which was a, a, a way to link uh, the military together. Okay, so what next? I don't know. Cryonics, right? This one struck me as uh, pretty relevant to what I was looking at. Cryonics, the science um, of cooling at extreme temperatures, a patient after their heart has ceased to beat, and um, maintaining a hope and desire for them to one day be brought back to this world, right? Uh, and so I visited uh, a few places. This is the Cryonics Institute near Detroit, Michigan, Clinton Township, Michigan, and just kind of begin documenting the environment there. Uh, these are some uh, cryostats, uh, soft shell, uh, six person stats. So each of these containers holds six people. Uh, and I think the Cryo Institute has roughly 90 people um, in cooling right now. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing to me, right? People are believing this technology is going to change the world, and they're going to extremes to stick around for it, or they're putting a, a sort of a newfound faith in technology um, instead of uh, what we've normally done, right? So uh, here is a place uh, called Suspended Animation. This is in Boynton Beach, Florida. What these guys do is they take the intermediary role between the hospital and the Cryonics Institute, or LCOR, um, two of the largest cryonics facilities in the US. Um, so this is the back of the van, um, the, the medical van. It's called the mobile operating room. Uh, so after a patient's officially pronounced dead, these people will be waiting bedside for you. And they'll begin the cooling process. They'll put you in ice, an ice bath, and they'll start pumping your heart again, right? Um, logic being, if they just put you in an ice bath, you know, the outside will get very cold, but the inside won't. Kind of like spinning a Coca-Cola if you want the whole uh, bottle to get cold. Um, and so they, they begin this uh, cooling process as quickly as they can before the patient gets to the cryonics facility where they are put through uh, an operation. Uh, they are uh, given this uh, cryoprotectant uh, fluid that drains the body of all the water and replaces it with a cryoprotectant. It's similar to antifreeze, right? And so when these people are cooled to minus 420 some degrees Fahrenheit, with liquid nitrogen, their uh, body tissues and their brain and, and their skin doesn't get um, frostbitten, right? So here's an old perfusion table at the Cryonics Institute where that performance would be done. Uh, you see uh, the medical operating lights above and then the different tubes um, that would put this into the body. This is called a cat stat, right? Uh, any idea why that would be called a cat stat? Well, that's where your cat goes, or your dog goes, right? Because you wouldn't want to be brought back uh, without loved ones. So when people do, do this, uh, they generally sign their whole family up, right? And everyone gets uh, cooled and put on um, suspended animation. Uh, and then there, I think they have, the Cryonics Institute has like 40 or 50 pets that have also been cool. Okay. So, again, to me, you know, I don't know where I stand on it. I believe in possibilities, uh, and I believe technology has, uh, I think the culture built up around it is very interesting. So perhaps you won't wake up in your body, right? Perhaps you'll wake up in a new body that walks in this world. Perhaps you'll wake up in a, a, a robotic body and somehow your brain will be transferred over. Maybe you'll wake up in a simulated environment like Second Life uh, this, so, or a virtual world, right? Uh, and so I've been in Second Life exhibiting my artwork and making virtual artwork and uh, you know, networking and meeting people for a few years now. Uh, it struck me as interesting where there is a, a actual uh, currency that is virtual, right? It's called Linden Dollars. 
and people buy and sell virtual goods. Um, the idea that something is recognized merely for its uh, intellectual value rather than its uh, material place in space is very intriguing to me. You can never touch these objects, you can never smell them, you can never taste them, but, but they are there. And we go back again to the uh, kind of adapting to a different body that we looked at uh, at the beginning. Um, I can take my Lindens from Second Life and transfer them to my PNC bank account down the street. And so you can actually exchange virtual Linden dollars to US dollars. And then, of course, the next logical thought is, well, that's right, US dollars are also pretty much virtual, right? I mean, we have a piece of paper that says there's something, but what is a dollar? And so I was interested in taking photographs, right, and beginning to challenge what is a photograph. And, and I'm working on a text right now about uh, a cameraless, uh, lensless, subject matterless world. Right, where an image maker can create a body of work, oh, say through viewing someone else's webcam and taking a screenshot, or through going into a virtual world, or through creating models in a 3D modeling environment. Um, and so I'm kind of not only looking at this new sort of virtual experience, but I'm trying to, you know, examine the, the changing role of photography, which is probably, which is my main medium. Anyone ever seen the movie Metropolis, 1927? Well, here they are in Second Life re-enacting uh, the entire movie in a live play format. And this is the uh, Moloch machine uh, at the end. And you see the guys marching up here, if, you, if you're familiar with the movie. Great movie. Uh, and so there's all kinds of things going on in this environment. Um, you know, you have rock concerts and poetry recitals and... Uh, art exhibits and, you know, parties. This is my avatar. And I, I, I guess it's one of those things you just have to experience, but your avatar does become part of you. Um, <coughs> I suppose we could see that happening with kids in a binky or a teddy bear. Uh, anyone who's had kids knows how hard it is to pull those away from a young one, right? Well, an avatar works in a different way with adults. Um, perhaps I'm at an exhibition and there's, you know, a hundred people there and I'm not a big crowd person. Um, and maybe I'll find comfort in the animation override that my avatar uses, which is something like this. Right? And then I'll go in to what my avatar does when it's in a crowd. And it was weird the first time I experienced this, where I was just mimicking what I've witnessed my avatar doing in Second Life to kind of feel grounded for a moment when I was maybe a little anxious for some reason, right? So there's a definite connection happening there, okay? Step two, we have the augmented reality apps, we have the virtual reality fully immersive environments. Okay, what if these started to just come up in the world, right? Remember that shot of the old people from the 40s on the street? And it was like they were right there. What if we integrated all of these aspects together in this room right here, right? I'm having some goggles on. They're telling me, uh, you know, what your Facebook profile says. You know, they're saying what your interests are, the book you're reading right now, right? Um, maybe a student who couldn't make it today is here virtually, and we can see them, and they could ask questions uh, in a more hologramic form. So this Digital Bodies project, uh, is looking at this sort of um, views of augmented reality, virtual reality, and real life experience that I've been uh, talking about. This is called Energy Share. This might look familiar to you. It was shot on the same day as Harness, right? And apparently it was done in Photoshop on the same night because I've used the same damn graphic. 
like it. This one's called Scanner. And so you see the inspiration now popping up from some augmented reality apps, right? I'm out in the middle of the snow field. I don't know. Maybe my battery died and I'm stuck out here. I can see there's uh, two people on the outer fringe of five kilometers, but there's one person within about two kilometers of me. I could go find them and see if they could help, give me a ride somewhere, whatever. This one uh, uh, is entitled Environ Reader. And again, I'm interested in the dissemination of information and knowledge. So I, I'm like, what kind of tree is that? I hold it up. It's kind of a dark projection. You see here, this tree is actually uh, illuminated red. And to the right here, you have an entire um, excerpt of the type of tree, the genus, the, um, the, the texture of the leaves, the shape of the leaves, what kind of bark it has, uh, environments that it thrives in. Okay, so questions can be answered quickly uh, through all this stuff, right? Okay. Last bit here, I know we're kind of running low on time. Um, start here. I did an artist in residence, and this is a uh, more of a lecture on formatting guide and symbiosis uh, that I'll be doing in New York City next month. But this was a fascinating experience for me. Uh, I spent the month of June in 2010 here, uh, living next to it, photographing inside of it, working on an audio project, sampling the environments. This is Biosphere 2. Um, if you were watching the news in the early 90s, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, most of you were not. Uh, it is a completely enclosed environment with biomes. There's a desert in there. There's an ocean in there. There's a rainforest in there. There's a savanna in there. There was an agricultural region in there where people grew their own food, right? Why was this built? Well, a very bright group of people wanted to develop uh, concept designs for building on Mars, right? Or in outer space somewhere. In, uh, in the 80s, the space race was still hot. We still respected the adventure of going out beyond Earth. Uh, and so this was something that was actually taken up and done. For two years, eight people lived inside of this Biosphere 2, it's called, and did not come out. They grew their own food, they managed their own environment, and they lived in symbiosis with it, right? Um, I'll take you through the inside briefly here. Uh, you have a window shot here. Within the hall or enclosed environment inside the mountain, it's inside the rainforest, and I'm looking out, I'm putting my hostel blood here. I'm looking out uh, a window into the rainforest that's kind of coming in at us, right? Um, here you have the desert environment, and you can see in the back this huge um, geodesic dome. That's a thing called the lung that I'll point out in a second. You see a good shot of the space frame there. There are over 6,500 windows in this environment. They're 250 pounds each. Uh, they can stand up to extreme impact. They would uh, fire ice balls about this big at 60 miles per hour to make sure they wouldn't break. Um, you know, the environment was top of the line. It leaked less air a year than the International Space Station out in outer space leaks a day, okay? That's how, this is the most airtight facility ever built by human beings. Um, shot inside the rainforest, another pretty shot in the rainforest. Here's a shot of the million gallon ocean. Originally it had a coral reef.